Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Summa Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Summa Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Summa Sambuddhasa Udang Damang Sangang Namasami So two weeks ago, we had a talk on the eight verses of training the mind, or the first two of them. And these are an ancient and beautiful set of mind trainings that are found in the Tibetan tradition. I used to have them memorized, but I'm going to have to read from them this time. They were created by Geshe Longri Tangpa in the uh, 1200s, and they are as follows. <clears throat> One, by thinking of all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, for accomplishing the highest aim, I will always hold them dear. Two. Whenever I am in the, in the company of others, I will regard myself as the lowest among all, and from the depths of my heart, cherish others as supreme. Three, in my every action, I will watch my mind, and the moment destructive emotions arise, I will confront them strongly and avert them, since they will hurt both me and others. Four, whenever I see ill-natured beings or those overwhelmed by heavy misdeeds or suffering, I will cherish them as something rare, as though I'd found a precious treasure. Five, whenever someone out of envy does me wrong by attacking or belittling me, I will take defeat upon myself and give the victory to others. Six, even when someone I have helped or in whom I have placed great trust and hopes mistreats me very unjustly, I will view that person as a true spiritual teacher. Seven, in brief, directly or indirectly, I will offer help and happiness to all my mothers and secretly take upon myself all their hurt and suffering. Eight, I will learn to keep all these practices untainted by thoughts of the eight worldly concerns. May I recognize all things as like illusions and without attachment gain freedom from bondage. So for those unfamiliar with the eight worldly winds in Buddhism or the eight worldly concerns, they're the set of forces, of dyads, that the Buddha described as guiding most people in life. They are pleasure and pain, gain and loss, fame, disrepute, and praise and blame. And the difficulty, well, first it's worth noting in those that half of them are related to our relationship to others. Uh, fame and disrepute and praise and blame are analogous in many ways with one another or resonant. And I think that's helpful when we consider where so much of our suffering comes, uh, our desire for acceptance, 
our hope to be looked at with uh, in good regard, to be appreciated, and how much that makes sense in light of our evolutionary history, where in some ways more than if you had enough food or didn't any given day, whether you were in or out of the troop of chimpanzees was more relevant for if you lived or died. And there's something helpful about recollecting that our fixation on being accepted and cared for is no accident. It's one of the more fundamental forces of our being. And I think it's a testament to the Buddha's wisdom that four of those wins have to do with praise, blame, fame, disrepute. In our better moments, the ideal would be a, to be and have the ability to step back from these forces completely and rest in a place of refuge with the triple gem, with the knowledge that our trajectory through life once we begin to practice, is no longer dictated or predicated on following, running from or towards these winds, these directions in life. And Ajahn Amaro, when monastics would take ordination, would frequently reflect that this is the true meaning of the homeless life, not necessarily taking on robes, but rather a fundamental change in the trajectory of the heart, where instead of seeking refuge and a home in the world, trying to find comfort, constantly chasing after pleasure, gain, fame, praise, and running from loss, pain, disrepute, blame, the fundamental shift into a homelessness is to look instead at life as just a journey and a path of learning, a place where we have something to give and something to learn, and no more than that. And that we more and more take refuge and place our hope of security in a path that is transcendent of that. This is beautiful to see when it's exemplified in its most powerful forms. Um, I'm writing right now, or helping to write, the biography of Ajahn Pasano, and just came across a story which I've told before, but I, I read it again this time. Two stories, actually, in this case, are worthwhile. One is, um, of a gangster who lived in Bon Pei, a fishing village near Ajahn, uh, near where I ordained, actually. And he came to the abbot of the monastery there saying that he was suffering and didn't know why. And the abbot, to his credit, uh, basically got him on a train and took him up to Si Long Por Cha, Ajahn Cha, and dropped him below Ajahn Cha's kuti and Ajahn Chah made him sleep there for two weeks straight. And for two weeks, this mafia boss basically carried Ajahn Chah's bag, sat with him as he gave Dhamma talks, prepared his food, and Ajahn Chah just talked to him and taught him constantly. And then two weeks later, the mafia boss went back to Bon Pei and gathered all of his uh, gang around who basically ruled the fishing port and told them that they were all going to keep the five precepts from then on out. So that means no killing, no stealing, no lying, no intoxicants, which confused everyone. But he, and I'm sure some of them didn't take it completely to heart, but this mafia boss knew that even trying to do something like this would mean the end of his not just his supremacy in the fishing village, but also of his life. Because as soon as 
the old and other rivals caught up to him and understood that he wouldn't fight back, then they would have him killed. And so the next year he spent his time tying up loose ends, making sure his family was cared for, and he was killed in the end. But he knew what was happening, and he took refuge in something much larger in the first time he'd had a sense of solidity, of clarity, of refuge. And examples like that, extreme as they are, can show us what it means to truly have found a refuge apart from these worldly winds, to have both feet solidly in something greater. The issue, though, is that when one of these winds hits us and we're, and we sometimes don't believe we're at their call or mercy until we see it compromised. So when we've done something good and don't get recognition or had good intention and are blamed, when someone thinks we are much different than we are and we see the story spreading, some of those are, um, then we see in that suffering how difficult it is and how much we are attached to these things. And sometimes the natural reaction is so strong that we don't have this ability always to step out into this place beyond those winds, which is where these eight verses come in handy. Because each one of them, apart from just stepping out of these winds, actually leans into them in a sense of, it's almost like Aikido. It uses the forces of the wind against it. So the first one, by thinking of all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, for accomplishing the highest aim, I will always hold them dear. So in one sense, and we spoke about this two weeks ago, this is acknowledging that though so many of those winds of the back and forth in our lives comes from those around us, this isn't a hindrance to our practice, but rather a chance to strengthen ourselves and to, be, to value others for that. The second, whenever I'm in the company of others, I will regard myself as the lowest among all, and from the depths of my heart, cherish others as supreme. This is leaning into the wind of, or actually all four in a sense, in that it's rather than stepping out of uh, looking at oneself as better than, worse than, or the same as, although it's tempered with wisdom always, there's a sense here of really embracing humility. And obviously this has to be held with care and hopefully is something that one would only approach when one had a decent sense of self-esteem to begin with. But if one doesn't have the ability to immediately step away from these winds, then this is a way of almost counterbalancing them in the sense that if you lean a post into the wind and the wind is strong enough, then you end up with a fairly straight uh, position in the end of the day. And that's much of what you're doing when you enter every situation, considering yourself as the one who is coming with something to learn, not the one who deserves the best there or to be listened to necessarily, but just a student and a servant and uh, a good friend of all those present with a deep humility. The third, in my every action, I will watch my mind and the moment destructive emotions arise, I will confront them strongly and avert them, since they will hurt both me and others. So, this practice of 
learning to see whenever negative states arise in us and not allowing them, but confronting them is obviously an important admonition and one at the center of the practice in that this path of mind training lets us and encourages us and requires us to bring this shaping of intention, this careful uh, focus on cleansing our heart and our goals and our actions and our speech in every moment. Though this is something we know, the language of confronting and averting negative emotions can be held and used in a damaging way for many Westerners and people in the modern cultural milieu. Because it seems to imply an intense and active and aggressive approach. So I think here it's very helpful to bring to mind uh, a sutta called the Sabhasava Sutta, which is in Majjhima Nikaya 2. And it speaks of a variety of ways that one can confront the defilements. The Buddha says that there are defilements, these taints in the mind, to be abandoned by seeing, to be abandoned by avoiding, to be abandoned by using, to be abandoned by enduring, to be abandoned by cultivating, and to be abandoned by destroying. So, so often when we hear that whenever a negative emotion arises, we need to confront it, we think only of destroying. Effort in our culture is so uh, aggressive and the paradigm for how we succeed and push ourselves tends to be one strictly of willpower, of clenching our teeth and getting things done. And so many of, our, of us have inner narratives dominated by this sense of trying to control and beat ourselves over past faults and somehow wrestle ourselves into alignment with the goals that we hope to hold and the path which we hope to pursue. So what's useful about the Sabhasava Sutta is the first way of abandoning, def aban abandoning defilements, particularly abandoning by seeing. And the sense that sometimes uh, it's enough to open so many of our defilements, they exist and flourish in darkness. And sometimes it's just enough to open the door and look at them. Uh, one analogy is that so many of this, these defilements uh, are like children kind of getting up to no good in the space behind, underneath a stairwell. And if the parent just opens the door and turns on a light and looks at them, then suddenly things become a lot less fun and the kids just get quiet. Similarly, when in meditation, uh, often when one can't stick with a particular meditation object, instead of trying to muscle one's attention back to the breath or a mantra or some practice, just acknowledging and naming the hindrance which has been dominating one, this act of seeing and making conscious and explicit the troubling hindrance in the mind is a powerful practice and is one of the more useful things we can do in meditation. A meditation spent calmly observing the breath is helpful in some sense, but a meditation where one 
begins to get a bigger or deeper understanding of a hindrance that dominates one's life is also a very useful sit. So memorizing that list of the five hindrances, sensual desire, kamachanda, vayapada, aversion, uh, sloth and torpor, tinamita, restlessness and remorse, utacha kukucha, skeptical doubt, wichagicha, and just seeing which is dragging one away and naming it. This is abandoning a defilement by seeing. Similarly, another sutta, the Vitaka Santana Sutta, speaks about a few means of abandoning defilements as well or of abandoning distracting thoughts which includes uh, replacing the thought. So if one has a negative uh, thought in mind, just bringing to mind its opposite. So uh, replacing a thought of anger towards someone with a thought of loving kindness. Um, of examining the drawbacks of that thought. Just seeing how it leads to pain. This is especially useful for, with anger so often, instead of trying to berate oneself for being angry, which is just obviously counterproductive, or trying to bring to mind a metta practice, which one just doesn't feel at the time, just seeing the drawback of anger and how much it hurts to be angry, having compassion for oneself trapped in that state of anger is sometimes the fastest route to peace. The other means of abandoning distracting thoughts include ignoring the thought, which sometimes is useful as, say, a fantasy which one has been through again and again and again. And you know that feel of a stale story you've told yourself, a movie you've seen a hundred or a thousand times, and just asking if you would pay to see that movie again, and letting it go not following. And the most confusing for many of that sutta, the Vitaka Santana Sutta, the dispelling of distracting thoughts, is the fourth means, which is one of steadily calming. The analogy the Buddha gives is, it's as if you have a running man who says, why am I running? Why don't I walk? And then the walking man says, why am I walking? Why don't I sit? And the sitting man says, why am I sitting? Why don't I lie down? So here, this is interpreted in a variety of ways, but I think one of the most useful is just seeing that most, first of all, it can just come to seeing the tightening and the intensity in our body that these negative thought patterns bring. One of the most useful things to do when anger or greed arises is just see how shallow your breath has become, how tight the diaphragm is, how your head beats, and how there's a sense of tension that needs to be released. And as soon as you notice that, then you can address and calm that pattern in the body and watch as the thought pattern associated with it in the mind and heart calms in parallel. So you calm the breath, take a deep breath and hold it, and then slowly release. You soften the belly, relax the tongue. Power, in the words of Ajahn Suchito, when you feel like, when you feel like powering up, power up right into your feet. So power down, and bring awareness to the soles of the feet, ground. And these are all useful ways of confronting a negative state without it being an overt or aggressive confrontation. We don't have to constantly be battling with ourselves. Sometimes it just comes down to use that metaphor in that 
calming of distracting thoughts again, to instead of being the person running after this thought or that thought, just sitting and watching them pass is sometimes enough. You just don't get on the train. A meditator recently, um, yesterday, was telling me about how in his practice, it's not that as he gets calm, the thoughts just stop. It's more that he feels less entranced by them and they fade and calm. And I think that's a very good metaphor for what happens. It's more that you allow thoughts to lose their valence and their charge little by little and begin to rest more and more in a bright center of stillness from which you can watch them pass. And that's enough. I talked yesterday, um, or last, two weeks ago, or well, last week, about an exhibit I saw um, with Van Gogh, where he, a quote was listed from him that said, a good painting is like a good deed. And although Van Gogh lived a pretty brutal life, I thought there was a lot of wisdom in that, especially regarding his work, where he would take one painting, one object, one subject, and paint it again and again and again, trying to get it absolutely perfect. And these were always the most mundane subjects of a sunflower or a haystack. And similarly, this admonition to watch one's mind constantly and work with whatever negative states arise, no matter how mundane the situation, is I think how we conceptualize our own practice as changing our life into a work of art. We take that same mundane scene of the conversation with the coworker or coffee with the loved one, the difficult conversation where your friend begins to gossip again and you have to decide how to interact with that. And these happen again and again, but each time it's a chance for us to paint a little bit better and to work with those negative emotions with a bit more skill and create something beautiful from that. And its repetitiveness is not a problem, but rather something that lets us fine tune our perception, our intention to purity. The fourth verse. Whenever I see ill-natured beings or those overwhelmed by heavy misdeeds or suffering, I will cherish them as something rare, as though I'd found a priceless treasure. I've spoken about this a few times in terms of the beauty of um, a Mahayana recollection where one looks on the most difficult people and situations in one's life as emanations of a bodhisattva sent to teach one. And taking a person as one's teacher, those who are most difficult in one's life. I think this is a very interesting conception of karma as well. Not as some force sent to punish us for past misdeeds, but rather a gentle hand trying to teach us and show us the pain that we brought to others so that we can truly internalize that lesson and never do something like that again. A gentle guide rather than a harsh punishment. I also find um, in this verse a resonance with a sutta I've brought to, uh, talked about before where the Buddha speaks about different ways of conceptualizing those in one's life who are difficult. He says that if one encounters one who is impure in body and speech, then, or one who is impure in body but pure in speech, then one should think of them as a piece of cloth, dirty cloth found on the ground, that one would carefully, with one's feet, tear off the clean bit and pick that up, leaving the dirty part behind. And just so, one looks to the good that one can find in those around one and brings that to mind. 
one approaches someone who is impure in speech but pure in body as one would approach a pond covered in algae and carefully sweeping away the algae on the top, bend down to drink from the water. One approaches one impure in body and impure in speech, but with occasional moments of clarity, as one would approach, a, as a starving or a, a thirsty man would approach an ox hoof print with a bit of water hidden in it, and bending down carefully so as not to disturb the water, would press their mouth to the water and drink slowly and carefully. And even so, one approaches such a person with care, not to disturb them, but touching only what beauty one can find there. And one approaches someone with impure body, impure speech, and without occasional moments of clarity, as one would approach a starving, dying man, journeying or dragging themselves across the desert just with compassion. And one looks on someone with pure speech, pure body, and pure mindfulness as a lush oasis. So similarly here, there's something very meaningful about seeing those who suffer around us as a chance to not only develop compassion, but also to be very, to develop a refinement with how we speak. In today's politically charged climate, when one is forced to approach relationships and speak to only the most important things, the spiritual goals of one's life, that which we share with one another, in our humanity, rather than those issues which are divisive between families, neighborhoods, communities, workplaces now, then one has to develop an immense care and focus in one's speech. Because whenever you stray into those realms which are fraught, and not that there aren't times when those conversations are useful, but one benefit of being in a situation where there's a lot of difficulty in those conversational realms is that one is forced to become meticulous and careful and focused with one's speech and continually come back to what matters in relationship and between individuals. And in this sense, one can look at, in line with this verse, those who are difficult in one's life as the greatest gift. There's also an important parallel in our meditation practice. Not only in seeing, say, the defilement or the troubling pattern in meditation as our greatest teacher in that meditation and being willing to name it and know that that's a use in the meditation itself. But one other um, very interesting segment I came across recently in Ajahn Pasno's life was his story of practicing in Daudam in uh, the jungle there, which is a remote area of Kanchanaburi in western Thailand. And it was pristine forest and he spent three months there, uh, during which many difficulties manifested. One of which was uh, the laywoman who had, was cooking him uh, a meal every morning, thought that because he was a Westerner that he could only eat eggs and nothing else except rice. So the first day it was eggs, which was good. And then the next day it was eggs. And the third day it was eggs. And um, Long Porpasano, being the amazing monkey, was, didn't say anything until after three months he'd gone blind out of one eye and had to go to Bangkok uh, where they realized that he'd basically gotten a form of something akin to scurvy and 
made him eat vegetables again, and he got better. Another difficulty that came was, uh, and I was just writing about this scenario, is he was walking meditation and a tiger uh, came near his walking path. And you can smell tigers before you see them. They have a very potent smell. And many of you will know the story in the sutta where the Buddha speaks about confronting fear in the forest and how his approach was to not change position until the fear had faded. And that was the approach Ajahn Pasano took. He just kept walking, even as the tiger loomed uh, several feet away. And after the fear had gone, then he went and sat in his kuti and contemplated what he would do if the tiger attacked. And he thought to himself, well, you, you'll, you'll die. They're far better equipped than you. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty great. And he kept on sitting through the night. The third was that he could never wash his robes with, and get them dry in a day. This is somewhat minor compared to the other two. But things were so damp that it would usually take at least a day or two before, after washing his robes, they would dry out completely. And what it did was it brought to mind the elements to him of water, earth, wind, fire, which is one of the most basic contemplations in the Buddhist um, practice and one of the most powerful. And rather than it look, being looked at as this arcane way of dividing up the world, um, it's an intuitive practice because it's no less arbitrary for us to divide the world up into this body and then everything outside of this body. This body takes in food, water, air, and exchanges it out again. We have some control over this body just as we have some control over the world externally, but not complete. And so it's a different way of dividing the world where you see that everything around you is just so much solidity, so much earth, just as you are earth. Externally, there's so much water, just as you are composed of water. And being in this environment of the jungle, uh, Long Porpasno was confronted with the elements very powerfully because he wasn't able to control them. He wasn't able to get the perfect humidity, the perfect temperature, the drying machine. The elements, their excesses and their lack, both, were apparent every day. And so it became more and more apparent to him that this contemplation of the world as the elements was the most potent contemplation he could use. And he talked about how that became his main meditation practice, was he would sit and think that this body was just as much water as the stream that was running by him, as the rains that were falling around him. What's powerful about the elemental lists in the canon is that the Buddha speaks of four at times, but then other times he speaks of six adding on the elements of space and consciousness. And there comes a time in meditation where those latter two become especially relevant. Because as you contemplate this body just as another piece of the earth, just something you're borrowing for a time that you'll have to give back. The sense of knowing divides and isolates and strengthens itself away from this body and this form. But then the Buddha doesn't let you step back even into that. He says the element of consciousness is also just one more element. And even that you don't get to take as a self. And so Ajahn Pasano talked about how as his meditation deepened, he saw more and more that even this sense of consciousness of knowing wasn't him it was just one more element amongst the six. And what you come to when you let go of all those is something the Buddha only would tip his hat at in the sense of Nibbana, awakening. A singularity of language which he saw no need to speak of in 
more detail than he did because it's not describable in any deep, in any clear sense by words, so the awakened ones say. But he did say enough to say that it's great, you'll know it when you get there, and it's worth moving towards. We had an interview with Ajahn Suchat, an amazing monk in Thailand. Um, and I asked him, uh, there's one more element sometimes spoken of in the suttas called the deathless element of Nibbana. And I asked uh, Ajahn Suchat where that fit in, and he said that's hidden inside the consciousness element. I thought that was a very interesting answer. And I know um, there was one great question and answer session where some monks were asking this teacher about contemplation of the body and of, uh, in terms of the parts or of, uh, say, the undesirability of food. And he said, that's kindergarten. What's the most powerful contemplation is the elemental contemplations. And I've seen this, is that in some beings who I, I've met in Thailand who I think were awakened, this is all they talk about is the elements. They say this body is just so much wind, fire, air, water. Earth. I think I missed one there. So all to say that each of those scenarios, those challenges, going blind and developing a patient endurance from it and humility, encountering a tiger and learning what it meant to face fear at that level and that the Dhamma was truly a refuge, encountering discomfort and using it as a springboard to move into these deep elemental contemplations and the liberation which can issue from them. Each of these is analogous in this verse of encountering a difficult person and taking them as our greatest teacher in that the situations in our lives which are the most challenging, if we have the faith to look at them not as a detriment or a hindrance to our practice, but as that which is meant to teach us something deeper, then they can be taken as such and as part of the path. So there's four other verses, but I think that's enough for today. Um, Dennis, do you, uh, would you feel at all comfortable saying what you're planning on doing and why you're doing it for a minute or two? Sure. Would that be too much on the spot? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Here, come on up. And you can take off the mask as well if you want. So I'm going to Birkin Monastery in BC, Canada. I quit my job two weeks ago. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say. Uh, I, I did think I had some reflections. Um, sometimes people They've been telling me, you know, you're young. You don't have, uh, you don't have a family. You don't have a house to pay for. And now's the time to do something crazy. Um, but I, I think about it. It doesn't seem like a crazy thing to do. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the practice. It's, it's the best thing that I've done. Um, it's yielded the best fruits. And I know not having it was terrible. So um, it, it seems like a rational thing to do. Um, I mean, I like my job, but if I think about developing those skills, those work skills, it's not as exciting as <laughs> developing uh, these uh, 
mind training skills and yeah I mean I'm I'm sort of uh, I feel like I'm in a precarious state like if, uh, if I'm practicing everything's great if, if I'm uh, but then but then it's easy to slip up and, and then I'll uh, play a little game on my phone for 12 hours straight or something and it, it, it's uh, yeah it doesn't seem like a crazy decision at all I mean it's it seems uh, like not doing it would would be really disappointing and, and, and stale um, so yeah I don't have a whole lot to say about it it's, it's pretty straightforward it's it's the most meaningful thing for me the practice it's the thing that when I'm practicing I'm, I'm, I'm really happy <laughs> uh, and, and then when I'm not I feel like a loser it sucks <laughs> um, it, it happens a lot I'm like back and forth um, so, can you speak about the last seven months, maybe? Just your general trajectory to this point at all? Uh, the last seven months, I mean, it's, it's a lot of ups and downs, like, like I've been talking about. Um, I'm, I'm practicing and it's great, and then uh, I slip up and it's terrible. Um, but, I, you know, overall, it's, it's been. Uh, like if you average everything, it, it, it's been getting better, uh, you know, ups and downs. So it's if if I think about it that way, if, if we average it out, then on average, every day is the best day of my, of my life. So <laughs> um, it, it kind of <laughs> it's 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 a uh, yeah, it'd be silly not to do it because yeah, it's it's a sensible thing to do to go off and. and spend more time practicing, but it's also the most exciting thing I could do. So, yeah, I, I don't have much else to say. Can we, uh, oh, Allison. Uh, what capacity are you going to work next year? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be the, uh, they need a kitchen steward. So I'll be uh, cooking for four or five hours a day, maybe. How long until we see you again, Dennis? Well, uh, there's a two-week probationary period <laughs> uh, so <laughs> you might see me in three weeks or so <laughs> uh, but three to three to six months otherwise if, if, it, if it works out any other questions for Dennis Yeah, seven, seven months ago, I, I'd say it was a possibility. Maybe not a year ago. Um, yeah, I think when, when I've been more in this group and, and exposed to uh, monastic elements, it's I've uh, reflected on it more and steadily. It's it's been uh, it's become uh, a reasonable thing to do. 